I'm Vanessa Santos. I'm here with uh, SME Oral History on uh, March 2nd, 2022 to interview my close friend and colleague, Jessica Kogel. Jessica and I have known each other for more than 20 years <laughs> and uh, we're both geologists and we're both in industrial minerals, so it's my pleasure to be here today. I would be so fascinated to be alive another hundred years to look back on you know what's going to happen with mining. It's mm. it's going to change fundamentally. Yes. In the next 10, 15 years, and it's, and we thought it wouldn't happen, but it is. Wow. No. And it and it's going to it's it's I think the impacts that we can have as a profession now are are like nothing we've ever seen before, and I hope we're. I hope we're prepared for that and that we're positioned to recognize that and and that we can really take the bull by the horns and, and really change the perception of mining. Yes. I mean, it comes down to, I mean, right, Egg, as you said right now, do we, it's almost we have a different view or, or my experience, and I'm sure you, of, of how we view mining and how we want people to know about mining. Yeah. and. And, and how it can be sustainable. Exactly, and that's an area, I'm glad you brought that up, Vanessa, because sustainable mining and sustainable development is something that I have been really interested in and have been very involved in through a number of different kind of activities that I've um, volunteered for. You know, a lot of this is volunteer work that I find the most rewarding. Um, and I really believe that, that mining is just something that needs, I mean, we've been sustained, I think we're getting more and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the perception of mining is, is starting to, to change just a little bit. But you know, mines and, and are, are really starting to take this the next step. If you look at what the Rio Tintos are doing, mm -hmm. I mean, all of the major global metals mm -hmm. mining companies, they're really taking this whole idea and concept of, of quote, I'm gonna call it green mining. Mm. And, and might be just in terms of their energy sources or right. how they're uh, using water and closed systems. I mean, I can name a lot of different yes. examples, but we're seeing more and more of this sort of thing happening out there in the private sector. And I think this is so, so very important, but we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. We have so many really, really amazing creative and I use that word very purposely, um, examples, a lot of ingenuity. And, you know, I often have said to people, if I had to get in a capsule and fly to Mars or to the moon or whatever, and, you know, to escape what something on Earth, <laughs> I'd want to take just mining engineers with me because I know <laughs> we would survive and thrive and do it well. Um, because mining engineers are just, you know, these are people that figure out how to solve problems. Yes. And, um, you know, the issue now is is we don't have enough resources to meet the needs of our growing population, mm -hmm. whether that's mineral resources or water resources or what they, you know, what they may be. You know, environmental protection is so important. Obviously, if you mine, you're impacting the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. We know that, yes. but you can also mine in, in a way that you're impacting the environment, but it's a short-term impact. And then you extract it's the value and you restore it to something as good as or preferably better than it had been prior to the mining operation. Something that the local community can be proud of, mm -hmm. something that um, can generate revenue for the local community, can generate you know, a healthy environment for the local community, whatever it may be, whatever value that community mm -hmm. wants. Um, you know, we have the power to do that, yes. and we do do that, but we don't talk enough about it. I mean, and that kind of goes to even how I think that we talked about before about the business of mining yeah. and how, the, how they look at the people that work for them or how they work, look at the community. Yeah. So, so how how is yes you know, how that changes and maybe in our careers how we've seen that with that we kind of done that all along at our level but maybe now it's becoming bigger. I think it's becoming bigger and I think you're right. I think you know one thing that's really important is if we're going to do sustainable you know mining or however you want to call it. I don't care what the word is. Um, it has to have it has to occur at all levels within the mining business or the mining operation. Um, 
absolutely at the C-suite. You know, and oftentimes that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see that that's what's happening at, you know, all the major companies. You've got to do that if you're going to have your social license to mine. Mm -hmm. um, but it then has to come, you know, through to the day-to-day -day operations as well. Uh, because if you aren't making decisions in the day-to-day -day operations that really push this idea of doing things in an environmentally um, I don't want to say friendly as much as conscious yeah. and responsible yeah. way, um, then you're missing the boat. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's just a word or words and it's you know maybe your your you know report that you put out annually, but you really gotta be doing it every day. You have to operationalize this. And I think we're seeing that transition and I think many companies have made that transition. Yes. Um, but it's it's a generational thing too. I mean mm -hmm. certainly you alluded to that um, over our time in in the industry i've always said that miners and mining engineers and geologists who work in the mining industry are are all environmentalists in in some way yes and we all love we uh, want to do a good can job i say we guys. love the earth we're all tree <laughs> hunters. um yeah no we want to we want to take care of the earth we mm -hmm. want to take care of our communities we're not out there to um make it worse mm. that's not our objective and never has been but things do happen and there are some legacy issues mm -hmm. that we still are living through yes. and we're still still you know dealing will. with and mm -hmm. we will continue to and really the idea is to try to head those off at the pass um but you know mistakes were made and it's not just true of mining you look at any industry yes look at the chemical industry i mean we can name lots of examples and um, I don't think any of these were necessarily made deliberately. And we see this in the area of health and safety too, mm -hmm. where you know sometimes um, mistakes were made, sometimes maybe shortcuts were taken because people didn't understand the risk or really what was at stake. Um, and so it's really about communicating clearly the science. It's about engaging the workers and empowering the workers so that they understand the risk to them as individuals yes. so that they can then play their role and take their part, take responsibility for themselves and their coworkers. Um, so there are a lot of things we can do. And I kind of see all of this kind of coming together in this whole ES&G area. Yes. And um, at the same time, we can become the example to the rest of the world of how to mine these minerals sustainably so that they can then be used in our electric yes. cars, our windmills, our solar panels, what have you. And Export that technology. Yeah. And so I think we play this this dual role in this space mm. that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And we just need to get used to, you know, mining engineers, like I say, are the most inventive people. They like to go off and invent. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be out there being the spokesperson, right? <laughs> right, um, right. None of us yeah, want to do that. That's really. right. Yes. So, so I think we need to start being better at messaging. Messaging, yeah, yes, yes. messaging from the heart. Too, mm -hmm. You know, yes. There's a real every passion. level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, and that's why I, I don't know if. Um, you're going to ever, you know, would ask me this question of like, why are you in mining? It's because I love the people. Mm -hmm. It's really comes back to the people in this industry. Yes. And I've just found them just We've been stimulating and, and yes. fantastic. And here we are. Yes. So you're still at NIOSH and maybe we could talk about sort of some of the the goals you set out when you got there and, and, and sort of what you feel like some of your accomplishments have been there. Sure. So, you know, when I got to NIOSH, I did what I think a lot of people do in a position like mine, just spent time getting to know the organization. I tried to meet with each employee. I couldn't meet with everybody because that would have taken me a lot of time. So I would do, you know, small groups of 10 and and just try to understand how people perceived the organization, what was working, what wasn't, you know, that, that sort of thing. And um, at the same time, I was kind of, you know, I know the industry because I come from the industry um, and also because of my involvement in SME. And honestly, I think I've only missed two SME meetings in the last 30 years. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I felt like I had the knowledge base to, to really assess what was working well at NIOSH and where we needed to continue to focus and where we maybe needed to make some changes. 
And one of the things I observed was that you know, we are the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. I really felt that we had safety nailed. We really, really had safety just, you know, we do these really amazing engineering controls and um, we just, you know, ground control, we are now we're doing mind design. We've kind of broadened our concept for that. And um, all of those, those things really come back to safety. If you're going to parse the world into safety versus health. And I felt maybe the health aspect, even though we have done tremendous work in the area of safety and dust exposure, again, developing all these uh, engineering controls and monitoring devices that have been very successful, have been introduced into the mines, have saved lives, no doubt. I felt we could take it another step and that we needed to take it another step. And then that really was something that we had to focus on. And so really elevating health so that it was elevated to the point of where we are with safety today. So that was one of the things that I um, looked at and identified as an area where we could improve. So what we did in response to that is we developed this minor health program that's um, still in its inception phase. And it's not something new that I came up with. As a matter of fact, NIOSH tried to do something similar before I came on board, but they, were, they ran into issues. And so I met with the director of the Institute who gave me a little bit of background history about what had maybe perhaps not been done as well as it could have been the first time around mm -hmm. when they tried to launch this new kind of minor health program that was really a, a minor health program that was to assess the baseline health of miners and then make sure that all miners retire with good health so they could have long retirements is sort of the goal of the minor health program mm -hmm. so that they're not uh, subject to occupational hazards. Black lung is a great example, silicosis. I mean, we, we have so many that our, our miners, um, if we aren't doing the right thing, can be subject to and can really change their lives and shorten their lives and maybe reduce the quality of their life. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that's the thing that we want to avoid. So this, this program in its first kind of time out of the gate, they really didn't bring in the stakeholders. And we have a number of different stakeholders. We have the industry, we have the miner and the mining community. We have um, academia, we have um, other government agencies, uh, local as well as federal and um, suppliers, and there's several others we can put in there. But those are kind of our main, oh, I forgot to mention um, another major one, which is um, the unions, organized labor. Mm -hmm. All of the stakeholders have slightly different perspectives, they have different needs, they have different agendas, they have different priorities. Mm -hmm. When they first started to launch this program right before I came to NIOSH, they kind of just put it out there in the Federal Register, which is how we do it. We make announcements in the Federal Register, but we had never really met with the stakeholders. And normally we would meet with the stakeholders, we convene some sort of um, workshop or whatever it may be to say, this is something NIOSH is preparing to do. We would like your input. What are your priorities? What are your interests? As far as I understand, that didn't happen or it didn't happen to the degree that, that maybe it mm -hmm. needed to have happened. And so at that point, um, the program was basically put on put on hold. Yes. And then I came in and I didn't know no, about that. No buy in essentially right. at that stage. No buy in at, yeah. at that stage. I came in, I didn't even know that this existed, but then I identified health as something we needed to be more focused mm -hmm. on, and then I got this other backstory. And so we changed how we approached it, which is why I say it's still in its inception, because we want buy-in every step of the way. We actually convened a meeting of all of our stakeholders. We had the National Academies uh, facilitate that meeting in Washington, and it was a really interesting thing. It was more of a listening session for us. We got to hear about all the things we didn't do well <laughs> the first time, which was really important. It was yes. sort of cathartic for yes. them really important for us to hear and understand. Mm -hmm. And so we took all that information and, and, and then we kind of relaunched a, a, a renewed program that had actually very different sort of goals um, mm -hmm. in the end based on stakeholder input. And so we've had a number of uh, meetings 
stakeholders all sitting in the room. Stakeholders, um, some are you know pushing one priority versus you know another group of stakeholders that have another priority, and we're trying to get all of that brought together in an integrated, comprehensive kind of program. So we're going through that process. It's actually being uh, led out of the Spokane Mining Research Division. And um, we have a research agenda on our website that's there for the public or anybody to view. And, um, you know, in this day and age of, you know, opiate overuse, of, you know, suicides rising, um, you know, fatigue, mm -hmm. heat stress, you know, lots of different health issues beyond black Mine, lung yes. and some of the things that we're all familiar with. Are now part of this program, mm. and they're all and their priorities um, for our stakeholders. So I think it's a really exciting time for this program, and I think we're going to continue to take this very kind of deliberate, thoughtful, stepwise process where we we bring our stakeholders along with us. Actually, it's more they're leading us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's their program. Mm -hmm. These are federal dollars. We will make the program happen, but we want it to be what they need. Yes. And, and it really, industry is key here. And so we come to SME and we'll put on a session and we'll have people from industry present what they're doing for their workers. And it's really been great to see what the conversations are in the, in the room when we have these sorts of sessions and kind of the, the dialogue that gets going and the excitement and the passion of the people in the companies who are leading these programs within individual um, companies. So. so I'm not adversarial anymore. I mean, again, it's to their interest, to the mining yeah. industry's interest, yeah. to again, to have that long-term healthy people and attract, attracting people. Yeah, to. exactly. Yeah, so that was one thing. The other ones one I already discussed, and that is, is, is you know, coal is still incredibly important. We mm -hmm. still have many coal miners that we have to, um, you know, help in terms of addressing issues, long-term chronic issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly related to dust exposure. But we also need to broaden our research and continue to push that envelope into, you know, new areas. And I think we've done, we've made a lot of really good steps and that's developing new relationships with maybe parts of the industry that we didn't have in the past. I think that's where uh, my industrial minerals background helps, um, though we, before I came along, had really strong relationships with uh, several leading industrial minerals companies who very much um, saw us as a research partner, which is what we seek to do. Mm -hmm. We want to partner with industry, we want to partner with universities. And I guess that would be another area. Um, we have what we call the extramural program. and. Um, with the passage of the Miner Act, um, we had funds that came to NIOSH that were then to be used for contracts and grants that were um, then awarded to both universities as well as um, companies in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And we have um, really most of these are contracts. Um, fewer of them are grants, but the con and that's sort of neither here nor there for you. But anyway, um, there is a distinction. The contracts. Um, there's a whole part of that contract program that goes towards what we call the capacity build um, program, where we're building capacity within the mining engineering community in the United States, because there was a real concern after, um, at the time that the Miner Act was passed, that we didn't have the capacity in the United States um, to really address some of the major issues uh, in ventilation or ground control, for example. That's odds, essentially. That's, That's what? Bodies. Yeah, bodies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so um, there, we just didn't, we, we were having fewer and fewer mining engineering programs. They were shutting down for various reasons. The one at Berkeley did, mm. you know, that was actually a program. That was where I first heard of mining was, <laughs> was uh, you know, when I was at Berkeley. Um, never saw myself in, in that industry, but I had at least heard of it. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, the capacity build has been tremendously successful. Great. We have had, I don't know, I wish I, George Luxbacher mm -hmm. um, also, you know, here at this meeting. He is the person who is in charge of that program and he could quote the statistics off the top of his head. I wish I had them. <laughs> um, as far as the total number of PhD students and professors that have been um, 
the recipients of these contracts over the life of this program, which has been over 10 years mm -hmm. now, it's been very, very successful. Mm -hmm. and, and actually NIOSH has not only had um, the benefit of the science and the engineering that has come as a result of these contracts, but also we've been able to hire some of the students that have been supported on these mm -hmm. contracts because they learn about NIOSH yes. and the work we do and they want to work for us. There you go. We learn about them and yeah. suddenly we've created a pipeline. That was not the, as far as mm -hmm. I know, the original intent, but mm -hmm. that's one of the benefits we've mm -hmm. realized. So that's another area that we have been expanding. Um, you know, our ability to do, we have world-class research facilities. We have world-class researchers um, that are federal government employees that work in our program, but we can't do it all. Mm. And it is a broad field, even though it seems really narrow because, you know, mining is a small community. It is a very broad mm. field and there's a lot of um, challenging science yes. and engineering that has to happen. So we have to rely on the universities to really accomplish what we want to accomplish. And our mission is, you know, to um, make sure that there are no mining f fatalities and, and, and reduce illnesses, chronic illnesses. And so we can't do that by ourselves and so we have to rely very heavily on both our intramural and our extramural program and that's um, something that we're continuing to expand and grow. We're doing more grants um, and it's all just I think in the end going to mean that we have a safer and healthier mining workforce and that's what we're after. So those are some examples. I think those are, are probably the main the main things. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's a that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a lot. Well, we've got some fantastic people who are passionate about making sure we get things done, and we do get a lot of things done. And yes. um, that's not because of me. That's because of the people that work in the program and really have a real drive and passion. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about SME because okay. yeah, right between. Emeritus and NIOSH, that's when you were president yes. of the SME. Yes, yes. And my presidential year was 2013, and we had our annual meeting in Salt, Salt Lake, Lake City. City. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so Salt Lake City keeps coming up. My yeah. first time I went to SME was Salt Lake City. Um, <laughs> that was your presidential <laughs> my year. My presidential year. We're here now. Yes. Yeah, so Salt Lake City has, there's something about Salt Lake City. Mm. Yeah. So that was, yeah, that was just a, that was a tremendous year. I had the opportunity to travel all over the world for I think SME. Almost more than anyone of the other. I think that might be true. Yes. Yeah, I was on the road a lot. All right, so let's name some of those places you got to go and I some got, of those people you got sure. to. Sure. So um, we went to South America. We went to Peru and Chile um, more than once. Mm -hmm. And um, met oftentimes with student chapters. I mean, that's the thing about SME that we have incredibly strong, I think, Peruvian and Chilean. Yes, we do. Student chapters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, then there were trips to, there was a trip to South Africa to, um, let me see, that was Cape Town. Yes. I've made several trips to South Africa. I'm trying to remember which one was SME. Mm -hmm. That was Cape Town. Um, went to Australia. Um, went to London. For that was for a cons conference. Went to Greece, and so either I went to Mexico. So either it was to meet with members and to participate in a conference. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it was to meet and interact with student chapters, as I mentioned. Oftentimes both of those things, if we could combine them both. And it was really about getting out to meet the membership and um, also to meet with executive directors and presidents of other major mining organizations globally. And there's actually a group that's been meeting for a number of years um, and they have a name which I've forgotten now, the, the Global Mining GM. Oh, I don't know what it is, Vanessa. Did I have it written here? That's terrible. You should have asked me this question six years ago. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's it's you know the the major um, professional organizations mm. in you know Australia, South Africa, uh, 
U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I think the U.K. Except for I'm not sure they're officially on board. We were they were sort of not when I was president. Oh, the extractive inner mineral. So yeah. Mineral. yeah. <laughs> so but the company that I worked for Emirates they had big operations in, oh, yes. in Cornwall and yes. yeah. So but they like many um, countries in the world. You know they had a lot of coal mining for example. Yes. And, and that's. Tin mining is yes. not what it used to be. You know, a lot of things are are sort of on a kind of maybe downward trajectory in terms of the numbers of mines and mm -hmm. the production mm -hmm. um, in England. But yes. um, so yeah, where else? I feel like I'm living out somewhere. That's I think a good. You, didn't you go to Morocco yeah. as well? That was later. Okay. That was not for SME, but that was about the same time. That was actually for the Colorado School of Mines. Okay. Yeah, that was really interesting. I got to do a two week course there in, um, I actually traveled all over, but um, it was. Um, phosphate. Pardon? Phosphate, yes, yes that's exactly right. Um, and, um, you know, I talked for or taught this group of what maybe 30 people about exploration geology mm -hmm. um, particularly for um, phosphate and, and also um, you know some broader sorts of applications like just industrial minerals in general they in particular have, sedimentary clay. deposits clay right <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so that was that was really uh that was a really fun experience yes. I really enjoyed that so that was for OCP okay yeah and uh, spent some time in Marrakesh and Morocco I mean uh Casablanca and then traveled around to some a other areas while I was there yes. just to have the opportunity to see that part of the world so just so yes. colorful and so interesting so presidency during not COVID so yeah you know, that you can't yeah. yeah yeah but uh, it was just a you know again a really I mean an experience that I never thought would land in my lap and that um, you were the second woman president right of, the of, second of, woman president of SME yes. yeah yeah it was just tremendous it really really rewarding and you had a lot of support from your company at that time. absolutely Emirates um, basically said go go do what you need to do take as much time as you need to take whoa yeah <laughs> no it was tremendous yeah they were really incredibly generous that way and um, so I got tremendous support and I got tremendous support from SME staff mm -hmm. um, from Dave Kanegi the executive director he was such a pleasure to travel with and to work with for that year um, yeah yeah I, w I would love to have the that kind of experience I mean you can't have that experience every year because it was just so <laughs> wonderful exhausting. But, <laughs> be exhausting right. but yeah I mean yes. in, in some ways it was sort of a, a pinnacle for me it really was but you say that but you're still so pretty heavily involved in this yeah I am but not to the same degree and now I'm really enjoying just sort of being a little bit because it is your community less involved but you know but you know I think this morning I went to the past president's breakfast and and um, I said to the presidents there that SME is my second family and it really feels that way yes. so I'm, I'm glad that I've had the the long-standing kind of professional involvement and um, you know it was like I said before when the doors open and there's an opportunity walk through it don't look back and that's probably what led me to the presidency and yes. that was never an ambition for me and honestly I like so many women in particular suffer from the imposter syndrome and to imagine myself as the president of this organization <laughs> mm -mm. yes We could it. talk about some of you. I mean, you mentioned George, but also some of the other folks. Oh, yes. Like Nick. Nikhil Trivedi. He's yes. been a great mentor for me. Yes. He was president when, um, yeah. So he was the one who called me to say, uh, we'd like you to consider being president of SME. Because the president, the current president, chairs the nominating committee. Yes. And, um, he's just been there for me all along and, and talk about a collaborative person oh yeah, yeah. Person. I've learned so much from him and I really look up to him and how he interacts with people mm -hmm. just his manner but then there's also the the technical side as well mm -hmm. but you know I think I've learned many many things from him and, and I think he's helped open doors for me 
maybe doors I don't even know that he helped open, honestly. Um, and Frank also broke. Mm -hmm. And you, you remember Frank. He was, <laughs> he was somebody else. And so I worked with Nikhil and Frank and um, <gasps> Stan Krakowski. Stan, uh, on, at oh, the that's tip right. Of my Let's mention that yeah. poem, shall we? Yes. <laughs> so um, the four of us worked together. We slaved, maybe is the right word. Um, I think that's for the word. A number of years. I think it was a four year project. Um, and it was the seventh edition of um, Industrial Minerals and Rocks, which is, you know, as you know, yes. being in the industrial minerals world is sort of like the kind of go-to technical reference, yes. reference, you know, for marketing, for technical yes. information, for um, geology, mineralogy. What and have I left out? How many chapters in there? Oh, I don't know. How but many? It's yes. um, yeah. No, it was, it was, uh, that was another experience that, mm. Again, it was a volunteer experience. Yes. I don't quite remember. I think I was sitting in a meeting, um, are you one of the many meetings. Are you were missing, or I was missing. No, I think I was the one that brought up that said, okay, so the last time this was published, mm -hmm. um, it was edited by Don Carr. <laughs> Don Carr um, was at the time, I think the, um, he was at the um, Geological Survey, the Indiana Geological Survey in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. So I knew Don because at the time I was also in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he, was he a state geologist? I think he must have been. I think so. I think so. I don't know that I'm, I'm going to have to fact check, check that. But anyway, um, so I knew of this book and I knew that Don had done it and I really respected this book and I knew that it was a much consulted and much um, revered tome, let's call it. <laughs> and so I think I brought up at some meeting I was sitting in that, hey, you know, it's been 10 years, isn't it time to revise it? Yes. And I think everybody around the table so yeah, yeah, it is. So you're going to do it, right? <laughs> See how that works? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And I think I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it, but I've got a full-time job. I have three children. I didn't say this out loud. This is all happening in my mm -hmm. head. Full-time job, hour and a half commute each way to work, mm -hmm. a husband who is either in medical school or just starting residency and three children. And I thought, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> This sounds like a really fascinating, a really interesting project that I would give anything to be involved in, but I don't have the bandwidth to, to carry this load, you know. So I recruited some of my supporters. And so it was me, it was Nikhil Trevetti, it was Stan Krukowski and Frank Alsobrook. And so we kind of divvied it up and all did it together. Um, and it was at least four years. I it was at know. least four years. Yes. And a lot of people, 110 authors, something like that. Yes. It, it was, talk about herding cats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please submit your portion. <laughs> Please but, herd my cats. Yes. Um, so, well, yeah, is. there was somebody else that, oh my gosh, I was trying to remember. We're, we're dredging up ancient history yes. here some, somehow, it feels like. But, you know, I've just had a lot of members um, and mentors that have helped me. And, you know, the other one that I alluded to earlier, the past president that called me about the NIOS job, that was Mike Karmas. Mm -hmm. There you and, go. And he's been another one who's, mm -hmm. who's just been, you know, always there supporting me, always kind of, um, you know, urging me to do things that maybe I didn't, see as something that I had the background or the credibility to take on. Yes. And um, the minute there was somebody there kind of cheering me on, I was, I was willing and ready okay. to, to kind of do it. <laughs> yes. And I was like, <laughs> my mother kept and still says to me, you have to learn to say no. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm learning. We've covered a lot, okay? So I think we did sort of want to just chat in general about, I mean, we did talk about the industry, but maybe yeah. to go back to, you know, attracting people to the industry yeah. and 
and and and I mean we talked about sustainability and things like yeah. that. So what are your yeah? So I think it's a real issue for us. I think um, everybody's talking about it. Yes, we've talked a lot about it. Yes, um, and how do we make mining as a profession attractive? And there are you know if you look at the mining engineering departments, they're seeing enrollments um, you know are falling. And that's obviously our pipeline to our workforce. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't a new problem. This is something that's been going on for a while and mm -hmm. it's a trend. And I really do think, and this is, you know, this isn't anything that's earth shattering or new and we all know this well, and it really is about the perception of mining and people, one, don't know that mining exists. I'm a great example, mm -hmm. right? It was a long time before I figured out what mining was. And then I ended up, you know, it being in it and I would never look back. But how do you get people introduced to mining? So if somebody's trying to pick a profession or even, you know, they're in school and they want to um, be an engineer, are they even thinking about mining engineering? Mm -hmm. Well, if yeah. they're on a campus that doesn't have mining engineering, they definitely aren't. Right. And if there is a mining engineering department on that campus, they probably still aren't. And um, when I was SME president, I would go to the, the student reception and during my years that I went. I did it like leading up to my presidency, my president year, and I think maybe a year or two after. Mm -hmm. And I would just go in and I would talk to the students and I would ask them, so how did you get into mining engineering? And um, I would say at least 50 to 70 percent, I wasn't keeping numbers, but somewhere in that ballpark would tell me that, well, I started out in another engineering discipline. It might mm -hmm. have been civil, um, for example might have been mechanical and mm -hmm. it said and i just found it so kind of dry and not that interesting and but my roommate was a mining engineer mm -hmm. and i heard them talk about their classes or you know somehow they had some connection to mining engineering mm -hmm. and they found out about it and then they would take a course and then they would yeah. they, they'd be there <laughs> yeah. and they would every one of them would say to me mining engineering is um so interesting because it involves all of the engineering disciplines and they loved the fact that it was this integrative sort of discipline on its own. And they also, many of them said that through mining, we feel that we can make a real difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And I hear that message over and over and over again of the younger generation is they want a job that will allow them to do something that has a substantial impact in the world. And it sounds a little bit like how I felt mm -hmm. when I was coming into it. Mm -hmm. And they see mining engineering as that vehicle. But you've got to somehow get people to that point of understanding and knowledge about mining engineering and i don't know how you do that and so many people as they're going through life whether it's the media or what they're reading in their school textbooks or what they're seeing in movies mining is not ever portrayed as something no. interesting as something techni technically challenging moral. <laughs> moral yeah however you want to put it mining gets a really bad sort mm -hmm. of representation and so people don't they kind of it's written off yeah and honestly that's how it was for me mm -hmm. and i remember as you know that radical berkeley student i was <laughs> i remember saying to myself i will never I will never work for oil and gas or mining. Um, <laughs> until you do. <laughs> until I did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, eventually you grow up, but mm -hmm. um, it took me a while to get there. So, so I think it's making those connections. I think it's changing the way that, you know, the whole world perceives mining right. so that there's a better, like you said earlier, the messaging has to happen. Remember that story you told me before, Jessica, about how you had a friend who said that maybe someday there won't have to be any mining? Yeah, I do remember that story very well. <laughs> that was a story where um, I was with a friend of my mother's, and we were just, she had learned I was a geologist, and um, the conversation started out with her asking me, what university do you work for? And I said, well, actually, I don't work for a university. And um, so at that point, I sort of let the conversation die. And I'd been doing that for decades and decades and decades. And I was just almost ashamed to say I worked in the mining industry. And I suddenly realized that that's not the way to handle this. That, that's not even true. And it's not even true. As somebody who loves this industry, really respects this industry, and believes in this industry for 
what it can do, positive things that it can do for, for you know, society, for the environment, etc. Um, I have to be the spokesperson. So fortunately, I then said, after hesitating, I work in the mining industry. I was kind of proud of myself finally overcoming that. And, um, and she then made this comment to me. She said, well, why do we have to have mining? Because aren't we going to be able to, can't we synthesize all the minerals anyway? She said something like that. Can't, can't we synthesize all the minerals that we need anyway? And um, it really was eye-opening to me because this was a woman who was very well educated and she wasn't in the, you know, in a scientific field, but she, I think, was very knowledgeable, understand how the, you know, understood how the world worked, but she had no mm -hmm. concept about raw materials, where they come from, why mining is necessary, how minerals are used. And so I use that as an opportunity to educate her a little bit and to talk about minerals and how they're used. And at that time, we happened to be walking, um, where were we? We were somewhere in Italy or I, I think it was in Italy. And we were walking down this ancient medieval, you know, street <laughs> with frescoes on the you know, walls of the churches and that sort of thing. And I was able to just start pointing out to her that the reason we have these beautiful cathedrals and the reason we can have frescoes and the paintings that are in all of the art the museums. The roads we're on. Yes, the roads, the, exactly. Mm. So I was able to give her all these examples. I said, we couldn't do that without minerals. These are all materials that were sourced from the ground. And then I think I probably told her what we all say, if it can't be um, grown, it has to be mined. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if you think about it, that's the case. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if I swayed her or changed her in any way. I said, yeah, we can synthesize some things, but as far as the cost and even the environmental impact mm -hmm. of synthesizing mm -hmm. things, because it takes tremendous energy, yes, that could be more damaging than mining. And I said, and mining is a temporary use. And if we're doing mining correctly, we're restoring that land, yes. as you and I talked about earlier. So, you know, these are the sorts of conversations that, that we need to be willing to have. And if we can start changing the perception, that's when the, when people start supporting mining, that's when uh, younger generations start wanting to be in this industry professionally. Yes. And, and, you know, and that may happen with this green revolution that I was talking about with this energy transition. I mean, look what Tesla's doing. Mm -hmm. um, supply chains are going to change. Yes. You know, they we're going to, they have to, <laughs> yes. and we're going to see companies suddenly like Tesla, this innovative company that everybody looks at as super high tech is, is like talking about mining, yes. right? Having to have and, some agreement. That and having agreements with mines and, and having their own mines. Yes. This yes. is going to start changing things. I think so, yeah. And, and, you know, again, we've got to be looking at this as an opportunity yes. because that's what it is. That's what it is. True. So somebody might say, hey, I work for Elon Musk. I work in his mine. <laughs>
And really, when I say doing good, that's probably rewarding, right? Maybe yes. summarize that as rewarding. Yes. We each define rewarding differently, but I think, you know, rewarding could cover that. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Is there anything else you want to say for some concluding? Gosh. Well, I would, I mean, this has been really very, very interesting to kind of go back down memory lane yes. and revisit some of these things. And I want to thank you, Vanessa, for uh, coming on this this little journey with, with me this afternoon. Super pleasure. Yeah. Yes. It's been really fun. Yes. And to think that there's something special about Salt Lake City, we have to unlock that That's mystery. That's right. <laughs> and so Salt Lake City and Georgia, where we first met That's a bazillion right. years ago. That's right. A bazillion yeah. years. <laughs> Went by in a flash. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we both had brown hair then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks so much, Jessica. That's super. That's great. I mean, I think, I think anyone can watch this, um, this history and, and maybe learn something and feel something and, and, and appreciate something. No, thank you. Thank you. All right.